we were rock stars. They see the way they get treated in the Sopranos and all these other movies, they walk in the places. They can glamorize the life and they still couldn't compare to what we were doing in the flight. I grew up on 101st Avenue. 101st Avenue is the mecca of organized crime. I don't care about Brooklyn, I don't care about the Bronx. You're getting people that are coming to you, trying to persuade you not to be in that life. I wanted to be with the Gattis, the Gambinos, the Truth Girls. I wanted people to see me with them in my Grioni suit, my date sick. I wanted to be that guy. You make a mistake, you get walked into a room by your best friend, you don't walk out again. When you have revenge in your heart, you might as well dig two graves, one for you, one for them. You took an oath, you die in this. I don't care what they did to your family. It's the way it is. You took that oath. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Millennials Choice Show. As you know, I'm your host, Matthew Ablican. I'm here with my co-host, Danny Ablican. What's, What's up, going Danny? on, everyone? And we always got special episodes. I feel like that's so cliche. I got to figure out a different way to say it. I always say we got a special guest, special episode, but the reality is they are special and we're very happy that we got these people on the show. And today we've got a very special guest, former crew member of the Gambino crime family, Anthony Hudi Russo. Welcome to the show. Thanks guys. Glad to be here. Shout out to everybody in Canada. Let's go. Yeah, yeah. 416 905. <laughs> you know what it is. We got a lot of love for New York, by the way. I proposed to my wife in New York. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. So I, well, I congratulations, got a lot of... right? You just had a new one. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we're excited about this interview. Um, I do a very bad job at asking our listeners and viewers to smash that like button and subscribe, but I got to do it. Please do that. It helps with the algorithm. We always want to bring this content to you guys. So please help us out. Leave us a comment, connect with us, and let's get right into it. Anthony, the first question I'd like to ask all of our guests is tell us about your upbringing, what your childhood was like, where did you grow up, and you know what kind of motivated you or enticed you to get into that life? Well, I grew up in a small section in Queens called Ozone Park. Um, it was right on the borderline of Brooklyn and Queens, the East New York section. And a lot of the guys within the five families came from East New York in the early days, which was the boomer. And I guess I'm considered Gen X, which I don't understand how any of this shit works. But we were the <laughs> next we were the next group. And um, that's all we knew. You know, I mean, I hear people talk about, you know, Bad Avenue, this place, that place, that it was a farm system. I just grew up with these guys as my neighbors. And that's who I wanted to be. And, you know, it wasn't the flashy cars, the suits, the money. It, that's mentality. You know, I always like to dress nice, look good. That's just something I grew up with. I just, you know, I'm Sicilian. You know, my father came here in the late 60s on a boat, you know, dirt poor with the American dream. So I grew up Sicilian. You know, I hear a lot of people say, if you weren't born there, you're not. Listen, I'm first generation Sicilian. My father barely spoke English. He spoke Sicilian in the house. We live Sicilian. We ate Sicilian. You know, these, these, we call them peasant dishes, which we ate every day, are now like big money in the restaurant. So the way we grew up is what they would call the Sicilian mafia brought here as a culture. So we were growing up hand in hand with them on a parallel, as you know, if you can understand that. So that to me was just the way of life. So, I mean, I can fall back as I can remember is like five years old. All I ever wanted to be was a street guy, a gangster, a mafioso, a stand-up guy, a knock-around guy, you know, whatever you want, a hard guy. Those are the names, you know, throughout history that we used growing up. And, you know, I was born in the 70s. I grew up in the 80s and 90s, which were probably the two greatest decades that I could, you know, that I could say, you know, I don't know how everybody else feels. And I got to see men's men, you know, guys that went to jail, guys that earned money guys that took care of their family, guys that dated the beautiful women, you know, like, and that's all I knew, you know, and I, you know, they say we don't have choices. Yeah, I had choices. It was the five families or the streets. Like, you know, like, you know, you could go on the streets and join a gang or hang out on the corner or join one of them. Yeah. I had choices. Who says any of them to the average person in society was good. You know, this person that struggles and goes to school for, you know, 10 years after high school and becomes this and becomes that and then dies of cancer at 50. You know what I mean? Like, to us, that was 
to me, that wasn't the way to go. You know what I mean? Like there was an old saying that, you know, somebody from the game, you know, used to say, rather live one year like a lion and 20 years like a turtle, you know? And for some reason that mentality was always drilled into our heads because we came from nothing. You know, my father died with nothing, born with nothing, had nothing, but he loved this country. He loved being here. Um, you know, and he taught us our Sicilian heritage. And to me, that went hand in hand with the mafia, you know, and now known as the life in America because that word mafia is just something that the press uses, you know. And, you know, I fought in the streets as a kid, stabbed in the streets, beat up in the streets, earned in the streets, fell in love in the streets, went to jail, came home, went back to the streets. And um, it wasn't that I was just, I don't know, I just maybe I was mentally finished with it or didn't like the way it was going. If things were the way they were 20 years ago, would I have ever got out? Probably not. Um, I'm one of these guys that don't come on here and say, don't glorify it. It sucked. I took the cap. No, no. There was guys in that, you know, listen, we were bad guys. I hate when people say, well, look what they did. Yeah, well, we were bad guys. We were criminals. I hate when people say only 10% of us were bad, only five, you know, there was rape. We were bad guys. We were criminals. What do you expect? Only 10% of us were decent. The other 90 were scumbags. Like, yeah, but I'm here to talk about that 10% that was good because all the guys that mentored me, all the guys I grew up with were good guys. They did their time. They were in the streets. They raised their families. And I look up to that. I don't look up to bankers and lawyers and doctors because being now legit all these years that I've been legitimate, those guys are the, some of those guys are worse criminals than the guys I grew up with in the streets. Hurting women, hurting children, robbing the system, robbing old ladies' pension fund. Guys in the streets didn't do that. We never hurt women and children. You know, we kept it, you know, and especially my crew, the only people we dealt with were people in the streets. And if anything happened to them, so be it. That's the life they chose. No civilians ever got hurt. No innocent people ever got hurt. No women and children ever got hurt. I can't speak for the rest of the life, but I can speak for the life that I grew up in, you know, and I'm not one of those guys that are corny and bitch. My mentors are great, you know what I mean? And I love every one of them. I'm here to talk good about that. So your story about the immigrant parents, you know, we can relate to that. Both of our parents immigrated here, they met here, and then they got married and had Danny and I. So we can relate to what you mean in terms of, yeah, you were Sicilian. Like for us, we feel like we, we are Assyrian. Like we speak it, our, our parents, now their English is better, but when they first came here, they never spoke English. So I get what, what you're saying about the first generation, uh, you know, from being from immigrant parents. So I understand that. Uh, in one of your interviews, you said something very interesting. You said that your your mother supported that life, like she was she was a fan of it. Yeah, yeah. And, and talk to us yeah. about that. How much that influenced you know influenced you? So when my mother's family came here, they settled in the Lower East Side of Manhattan, little Italy section, Mulberry, Mott, Christie, Hester. My my mother's uncle had a club on Hester Street, right around the corner, down the block from O'Neill's club. Uh, her father was a gangster. Her father was grew up and was very close with Sonny Francis. He did seven years. My mother's loved Sonny Francis. I mean, at my house, it's a, I mean, my father hated it. Even though my father's uncles were all wise guys in Sicily, my father had hated the life, wanted nothing to do with it. But my mother growing up on the Lower East Side, and my mother's a boomer, you know, she grew up in the 40s, and she loved it for some reason, the wise guys, that's what she attracted to. And she kind of, she didn't instill it in me to be a wise guy, but she instilled me being that tough guy that the wise guys and the respect. And so she grew up around all those guys. Uh, very close to Vinnie Sarah from the Bananos. That's her, like her age limit. Uh, Sonny Francis was like, you know, I met him at my grandmother's funeral while he was on the land. Uh, he was the first wise guy's hand I ever shook. I was five years old. And um, the, like, I never heard the end of it. You know, my mother would praise that. Like we weren't allowed to watch gangster films and we weren't allowed to watch any film that, you know, showed Italian and Americans doing bad things. You know, it wasn't, I mean, I watched BET, I watched hip hop, I watched, you know, Scarface. I wasn't limited to whatever I could do in the house if I was allowed to. We didn't have no, but just my father's one thing was, I don't want anybody showing you, like we're hard working, my father's a brick and block guy master mechanic, worked with welding. Like he was a hard, hard work. He came here and built things and houses and buildings. And he wanted that to be instilled in us. And my mother wanted the streets to be instilled. My mother used to drag me down the stairs at five, six years old to fight kids in the street one-on-one. -on -one. 
You know, like that's like she was a. They, I mean, my neighbors, everybody, she's known in the city line. She, they call her the city line mayor. She was a gangster. They used to call her a gangster. She was like four foot eleven, and she just loved everything about that. She would go to the club once a day and complain about kids hanging out too late, or you know, the old school way. And uh, she kind of instilled because you know, the father's not home seven days a week. He's home for dinner, to go to bed, up at four a.m. back at work. So when he was at work, she instilled that life in us. You know, but never said it was the gangster life or the wise guy life or the mafioso life. But that's what she was instilling us. And then when my father came home, it wasn't spoken about. So, got it. I so, mean, I, if you have boomer parents, I think everybody understands that. I don't yeah. think even boomer parents, mother and fathers, even got along. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> some of them, it was always just like an understanding or an arrangement. You know? It's I true. was just gonna ask you, like, how? So with that family dynamic where your your dad was not really for that life and your mom was. I guess you just kind of lean more towards, you know, what your mom was kind of encouraging, right? As opposed to your dad, because yeah, right. he wasn't maybe well, around as much or? You know, back then work? you weren't allowed in the house. So you were in the streets. Hmm. So all the kids were talking about is who got clipped the night before. I mean, imagine eight years old, you're sitting on the stoop in Brooklyn or Queens. You're not talking about what the Yankees did the night before. You're not talking about who's becoming a doctor or a lawyer. Guy got clipped two blocks over. Who got clipped? Oh, he was so and so's cousin. Oh, he was dealing drugs and he shouldn't have been. Or this guy OD. Like those were the conversations at seven, eight years old in my neighborhood. So it's kind of hard not to. And then you get pushed by it by that one parent at home. And you don't got to be home until the street lights come on. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And you got to remember back then, everything in the eighties and early nineties. Uh, you know, I become an orphan at thirteen. My mother dies of emphysema, and then my father gets sick shortly after that. And then I'm in the streets full time. So before that, you just, you're home when the street light comes on, you eat dinner, you know, you take a shower, you go to sleep, you wake up, you either go to school or you come home and hang out. You get home from school, you get right back out into the streets again. And there's nobody talking about who wants to play shortstop for the Yankees, who wants to become a lawyer. Who, yes, everybody knows you're going to wait, you know, in that life, in that neighborhood, growing up poor like that. Back then it was limited choices. You're going to work for the city. You're going to become a union worker. You're going to become a street guy. You know what I mean? If your family got a few dollars and they can send you to school, you're not even hanging out with kids like us. You're away at baseball camp or this or that or after school or, you know, they're trying to, you know, raise you a little bit better. But it's, it's right in your face. And, you know, it's not that – it's not all you know because you do get outside. I used to go to Manhattan. I used to go to Brooklyn. You know, i seen other things. But for some reason, growing up like that, playing wiffle ball and stick ball and stoop ball and man on, and, you know, it was just that Italian culture was just so beautiful in the 80s. It's just it was so enticing that you didn't like anything else. Got it. You, you literally just used the word that was coming to my mind as you're sharing the story about culture. After speaking with a lot of, you know, people that were in that life, it seems to be the main reason why you guys wanted to join is the culture, sure, the money, the the women and the respect and the power, but a lot of it just seemed to be the culture. Like we were speaking with Larry Matza and he, he was saying that he came from a good upbringing, a very good upbringing, and his family had his back all the way through, even during times when he got, uh, when he got arrested. So very interesting. It's people were in love with the culture, it seems like almost. Yeah, I mean, those are the people I think don't belong in the life. Like if I had support at home, you know, I had the right clothes. I could go to school. I didn't have to worry where my next meal was coming from. And then I could continue my schoolwork and not worry about having to go out and get a job. We were dirt poor. I, I didn't have that. You know, I shared boots and socks with brothers and cousins. You know, if cousins, families were doing bad, they sent their kids over to us. We got sent away for summers to Miami. Like, we didn't have it like that. And I always thought, because I, I love learning. I love to go to school. I never had a problem in school. Um, you know, besides fighting, I had a little special class because all I did was fight and cause trouble. That's just, you know, that's how I was built. But I like to learn. You know, I tried to go, like, I just didn't have the opportunity to come home and study and, and learn, you know, to go further my education and become something. I think the people that have their family support and they come from that nice middle class family should never even think about coming into the streets. And if that's not the culture they were raised in, they shouldn't like that culture. You know, me, it wasn't the money. It wasn't the women. I always thought it was the women. It was the money. I like beautiful things. I like nice things because I never had it. Never had sneakers. Then I owned 200 pairs of sneakers. Then I owned my own house. Then I owned five cars. Roll. I had it. And to me, 
I come to terms with it late in life. It was the culture. I love the Italian culture. I love the Sicilian. I love the Sicilian culture. I, really, the rest of Italy can you know fall into the sea. But just the Sicilian culture that I was raised in, I seen from my father's perspective, and then I seen from my mother's perspective. They both, you know, she had the Sicilian outcast, and he had that Sicilian farm boy growing up, learned how to work with his hands, not his mind, and. I, so I see, and I loved it. I love the hard working part and I love the easy part. And I, I just love the whole thing. You know what I mean? Like I'm a guy that can eat pasta seven days a week, you know? So, <laughs> I, and then I so figured that out. So yeah, that's yeah. what I'm saying. But then I figured it out. It, it wasn't the money, it wasn't the women, it wasn't the power, it was the culture. I was in love with the yeah. culture. And I'm gonna die being in love with the culture. Awesome. And and by the way, I'll add that we can also eat pizza seven times, <laughs> seven uh, days a well, week. <laughs> that's what it is. Now I've been asked that question. If there was one food you can eat for the rest of your, it comes back to pizza. You can it eat pizza to. every day. Oh, pizza. It has amazing. to. Yeah, no, I love it. We love like it. when I was younger and we had such great pizzerias in my neighborhood, I would go from Ozone Park to East New York into Brooklyn. And I got, I tell you, I had to eat two, three, four slices of pizzas a day because we had such great pizza growing up. And I just remember, I was like, wow, how did I survive? My cholesterol, anything. Like, I just <laughs> ate pizza. I had a slice. There was no way I went a day, even though I, if I went home and ate dinner, if I went out there, I always, throughout my day, running around in the streets, but I, work, I definitely ate two, three slices of pizza a day. I'm going for pizza tomorrow, and I'm bringing a Portuguese guy with me. We're going to a very good, like one of the best Italian joints in our area. So we're located amongst a lot of Italians here, and we got all the the awesome restaurants. If you guys, if you ever get a chance to come to Toronto, we'd love to, you know, get together. Yeah, I heard there's a big, uh, they, I heard they got a nice Sicilian fraction up there. They got lots of lots of they different just, spots. They just clip, they just clip the bookmaker, and then they just clip the guy's daughter-in-law last night, right? A guy that got clipped back in 2013, his daughter-in-law got clipped outside the nail salon. They clipped a woman just recently this week. In Montreal, right? Yeah. yeah I heard yeah, about Montreal. that. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The, the Rizzuto family. Yes. And wow. those guys don't play up there. Ooh. Yep. I know. So they're in that women, show. They're driving around in bulletproof cars. I mean, that's, that, that Sicilian mafia up there is no, they're like the Nangrata back in Sicily. So in that show, the Rizzuto show, it's on Netflix. Um, I forget what it's called. Um, but there's that show. show yeah, there was a show on wow. it. What do you remember? What it's called? I don't. Know. I, I watched two seasons of it. Maybe Carson, you could look it up. Didn't look even up know. I, yeah, I don't. I'm not big on those mafia shows. I've only watched the yeah. Sopranos once, and I thought it was terrible. Yeah, look up Rizzuto and look up uh, like Montreal and look up Netflix. Yeah. But bad blood, bad blood, bad blood. All right, I'll yeah. check it out. And so there's a scene in one of the in season one in one of the earlier episodes where they're actually meeting in Vaughn. Ontario, which is where we where we are. So, really, wow. Yeah, I don't. It's not. I don't think it's that like prevalent today. It's very yeah. underground and and maybe legitimate businesses. I don't know, but yeah, that's that's where we are. So very fitting that we're doing. Yeah, these well, listen, the banana <laughs> boss here in America got deported after he did his time years back, and he chose to go to Canada instead of Italy, and they found him in the river dead within like oh, a month. Oh, wow. And he was the boss. Damn. And you don't yeah, touch him, right? Yeah. Yeah, he was the boss of the Banano family in America. Wow. Yeah. Wow. The iron, the iron worker, they called them. Uh, on that point, like, how does that work in terms of like the logistics? Because you're obviously like bosses are off, like you're not allowed to, you know, do anything to them. But does that apply for like other family nah. gangs? Like, no, no. Well, I think once Joe, well, up there you, is the Banano family. That's what you, Joe Banano started that family years and years and years ago. And then Joe Messina really kept those guys around. As you know, the Rizzuto was in on the hit from Donnie Brasco. That's how he got, that's how, yes, he was part of the captains. He came here. He actually came back here. Canada, which I know you guys aren't doing well right now in government, but you have like this, no putting people away for the rest of their life, no death penalty. So Rizzuto went back to Canada and then somebody flipped here in the United States and said he was at that murder. So that murder that you see in the basement, that was that was Rizzuto. That was Zito Rizzuto who did that for them. They called him in from Canada to do that. And that's how he got that big position down there. Joe Messina gave him that. But when he got he did that hit, he went right back home, took over that, you know, they, I mean, his father was already the boss, but got a lot more power because of Joe Messina. And then somebody flipped and said Rizzuto was there and the United States wanted to bring him back. And Canada says, no, we're not sending them. They didn't want to send them back. And they said, well, if you come up with a decent agreement, I mean, it was like four murders. He did like six years. He came back to the United States. He did his time, Rizzuto, in the United States. 
and they went back to Canada, and then they clipped them. Then he got clipped, whatever. The father got clipped, and the son got clipped. I mean, those guys, they just clip people up there. And nobody ever gets in trouble for it. I, I don't know how the organized crime unit works up in Canada, but there are a lot of guys from here don't want to go there because they don't know who the players are. They, they use the Hells Angels, or they use the other biker gangs, and it, it's crazy up there. It's the Wild Wild West. But, yeah, Rizzuto came back here, did time for that captain's murder. Look into it. It's a great story. Um, and then he went back to Canada, and then I think he winds up getting clipped. And then, uh, or he was poisoned by it, one of his guys or something. Yeah, it like was that. whatever yeah. it was. They killed yeah. him, you know. Yeah. And then yeah. that, and it just known like anybody from the United States in the mafia that went there would just get clipped. Especially after Joe Messina, it was just the Wild Wild West up there. Nobody knows who's still running the family, who's still doing things because the United States don't have any. From when I left the life years back, the United States had nothing to do with them anymore. After Joe Messina went bad in the early two thousands, so now it's just. Probably all the Sicilian factions, just nobody knows. If Canada has an organized crime team, they're probably the only ones that really understand what's going on with these. I mean, they just clipped a woman, guy's daughter-in-law. They clipped the guy back in 2013. He was a high-ranking member, but they clipped him here, I think. And then she just got clipped. She owns a nail salon in Toronto, and they just they clipped her right in the parking lot. Somebody was arrested for it. I just don't know who. Wow, Canada is low key gangster. Oh man, out here. not for the good parts. No, <laughs> that's crazy. <laughs> when I was growing up, I only heard about the clans, which were the guys that sold the marijuana. They, you know, they had their little wars, and then the bikers. We knew the bikers up there, you know, ran all the pills and everything else with the American Indians, and okay. that's all I knew. And then all of a sudden, in the late '90s to early 2000s, they made a big, big, they made a big splash with the mafia up there. Which, I mean, they were there since the 60s, you know, whatever it was when Joe Bonanno set them up. The Mozzarella King, right? There was the Mozzarella King up there. That was Joe, that was Joe Bonanno's guy. Uh, some big Mozzarella company up there. Oh, okay. There's I'm a lot sure. of history up there for the Sicilians. Yeah, I've never even thought of, like, looking at, like, reaching, I don't know, looking out. Oh, yeah, there's, there's a lot. There's a lot. Yeah, there's so, a lot of history up there. So, Anthony, I was going to ask you. So, we just talked about how, you know, people from the States come to Canada and they just get clipped. There's not none of that mutual respect, but... Obviously, correct me if I'm wrong, amongst like the New York families, there definitely was that mutual respect, right? Correct me if I'm yeah, wrong. And, yeah, And they definitely absolutely. had certain ground rules, right, in terms of uh, stepping, yeah. I guess, on turf or whatever and, and well, getting you involved. Know, I don't know how the turfs worked before the 70s, but from the 70s on, I can speak of, it was guys. You know what I mean? Like, it wasn't neighborhood, you know? You knew, like, the Lucchese's controlled Picking Avenue, you know, they had Picking Avenue. Not that they control, but that was their territory. So if you went into that territory, you're going to whack a guy out. You had to ask Lil Casey's permission. Things like that. But like um, like when we were doing business, the guys in my crew, they, they had strip clubs. I wasn't involved in that. And they the guy that owned the place was a Gambino. But the guy that supplied the girls was with a banana. So then the Gambinos and the banana sat down. This is how we're going to split it. You're going to get this much of the, you know, the bar and the door, and we'll get this much from the girls, and you got to come to an agreement or go to war, because that was almost a war, if you, you know, one of the stories I told over one place. And uh, they come to an agreement, and that's it. And now it's a banana Gambino drug. That's how it is. You know, like, you two could be doing business, right? But you could have went to grade school with a Gambino, and you could have went to school with a banana. Now, you go into business, hey, hey, you're over here, but you're over there. You'll come to an agreement. And then if maybe if there's an opportunity... Now, if it's legitimate, I mean, the crew that I grew up with, we didn't get involved in legitimate business. That's why we lasted so long. No construction, no unions, no anything like that. E even though I had friends that gave me no show, it had nothing to do with the Gambinos. That's one thing why we lasted so long on the streets. We only stuck to the streets. But if you go into business and it's totally legit, we I can hang out with you. I'm a Gambino. You're good enough. I can hang out with you. The first time you take a bet, a piece of drugs is sold in there, or anything like that, then we step in. Anything illegal going on in the business, we got to get a piece of just because we're friends, you know? And I may not want to, but my crew is going to say, you got to talk to him because he's your friend. And then your guy's going to step in and say, you know, you're not taking no money from my guy. And then that's how that all works. You don't just get that territory or that block. It's usually got, from back then, everybody's grandfathered into the streets. Who's a friend, who went to school? Because that's how it works. And, I mean, you know, people like, you know, when I got involved in the life, I was, you know, 18, 19, but I, my next door neighbor was a Gambino captain. The guy down the block was a Lucchese guy. So I would go into places with my friends that were wise guys now, you know, my captain, and I would say hello to wise guys, and they're like, what are you doing? 
And I'm like, but these guys are my neighbors. You know, I can go over and I can talk to them. I don't need to have a sit down. If I got a problem, I can ring his bell. I don't have to call for his captain. Because, you know, you got to call for the guy's captain. Like, it's a whole, that's a whole thing. Like, like what you just asked me, if there's a beef where you want to flip a guy or a guy stole money, you got to call his captain. That captain's going to send, you know, an emissary to come down and talk to. And they're like that. I used to just, you know, and then after a while, they kind of use it. You know, do you go see this? I sat down with bosses, under bosses, without having, you know, to go through the proper channels. Because I grew up on 101st Avenue. 101st Avenue is the mecca of organized crime. I don't care about Brooklyn. I don't care about the Bronx. All five families had social clubs on 101st Avenue. My apartment building that I lived in was on 101st Avenue. So I could tell you every wise guy from the 70s to the early 2000s, 38 years I was on those streets. So that's like my relationship. Guys who come in clubs and they do an introduce and they introduce you. I know Russo. They didn't know my nickname was Hootie because I didn't get that till 91. I know little Russo his whole life. Like, you don't got to introduce me to him. He lives down the block from him and he's this one's neighbor or, you know, that's how it was. Did so, you find that helped you with, you know, everything yeah, that yeah, you had going on? Did. Because they all kind of, they knew you, right? They just knew you. And as a result, you didn't need an introduction necessarily, right? Yeah. So when I started making big money, like real money, it was towards the end of the mafia, but the mafia still had the stronghold. Like after a while, I was like, there's nobody coming. Like me, I, will, I still go back to the old neighborhood. I go to the same enough because they got nobody that's going to come after me that I can't go after. Now, don't get me wrong. I say this all the time. Some 22-year-old kid trying to make a name for himself can walk up to me anytime and put one in the back of my head. That I can't deny. But I'll never be scared to face anybody one-on-one -on -one in this day and age. But when I first started earning big money, every guy was a serious guy. It wasn't like there was one guy that was a serious guy. Everybody was a killer. Everybody was a tough guy. Everybody was this. Everybody was That's how it was. But what helped me was every, nobody knew if I was a Gambino or Banana. They just thought I was somebody. They knew I was Sicilian. They knew I grew up on 101st David. They knew I had wise guys as friends. They knew my mentors were all 15. Well, it's a lot of guys that I stood with are in their 60s now because those, those guys I stood with every day. They took me everywhere, showed me how to eat, cultured me. If you listen to my interviews, I talk about that. I never really stood with anybody my, old age, my own age until I got with my crew. And those guys, they were all my age. And then my friend's father was the captain who was my mentor, who's in his 70s now. So everybody always thought, so it, it worked in my favor. And I grew up with these really tough Irish guys that are in their 50s now. And, and they had mob connections, but they never got involved. And they used to say to me when I was getting into that life, you're going to go from making X amount of dollars to making less and then put yourself in the limelight. Why would you do that? When everybody already thinks you're a connected guy, that eventually you're going to be, like, you know, you already get that mentality. I get it from the Spanish and the Black that I'm selling drugs with. And then in the Italian neighborhood, everybody knows I'm Sicilian. Most of the kids grew up with enough. So they already think I'm in. So they're like, why would you want to put yourself now where the FBI is going to see you? You're going to make a lot less money when you get out of the drug game, when you could just keep doing this. And everybody, no one's ever going to, everybody already thinks you're kicking up to somebody. So nobody knows who to ask. So it worked for me growing up in that life, growing up around people. They were like, well, who's he with? Oh, he must be from Andre. He's from Andre the first family. He's got to be with Ron. Or he's from City Line, so he's with Vinny. Or that's how, and it went like that for years. And I never kicked up to anybody. And I remember my Irish friends getting together, these tough Irish, Italian, Polish, Jew. We had like a nice crew. And these kids were the toughest kids in the whole neighborhood. So the mob didn't even bother them. And they were my mentors. They were all, you know, a lot older than me. They said, who do you got it? You're making tons of money. You're going to be rich. And no one will ever know where to go. No one will ever know who to talk to, who to see. And the FBI will never look at you. You know, and they told me that before I got involved with these guys. And they were right. But I, again, the culture, the life, I didn't want the money. I wanted to be in the London. I wanted to be seen now in these guys' circles, not only the street circles. So, you know, I made that bad decision, but I knew when I made that bad decision, it was. And people were wanting me. I knew. Now, people say, I wish I would have known. I knew. I wanted to be a part of it. And I, I'm here to admit it. People don't want to, oh, I grew up in it. I, I wanted it because I was already away from it. I was 18, 19 when I got involved in it. I wanted to be with the Gaudis, the Gambinos, the Truthios. I wanted people to see me with them in my Brioni suit, my tape sick. I wanted to be that guy. You know, and I, I, feel, I felt like it was my birthright being a Sicilian American first generation. But, you know, things change. The life, like I said, if the life was still the same, I'd be dead or doing time right now because I wouldn't have left it. He's keeping it real, keeping it 100. Always, 100%. That's what, that's what you get on our show, you guys. These. Oh, I, listen, I hate when these guys come on to I took the cap. Now, everybody thinks when they say 
because they told I took the coward way out that it's acceptable. It ain't acceptable. You're a garbage pail. That's it. That's how I feel. You know what I mean? I got to I got to keep that life was great. And when they come on here and say, ah, you know, it was good. And then it went, they, they always got it. But whenever you hear, but you know, they're bullshit artists. So I want to, so on that point, you're doing your thing, you're in the streets, you're hustling, you're hitting them hard. And then you want to join now the Gambino crew. You said in one of your interviews, those were like the rock stars. They were the ones just yeah. really, you know, doing their thing. And obviously with John Gotti, like we all know about the Gambinos. Rappers make, you know, they mention the Gambinos in their songs. So we, we all know about Gambinos. Now, what age were you at? And, and how does that process look like? You talk to somebody from the family and they initiate you or what did that look like? Well, the thing was, it wasn't that I wanted, I never, I always said, now I'm in the streets, I'm dealing with drug dealers and tough guys and killers. Like I'm in, you know, early nineties, late nineties. And I always said, they see, you know, 101st Avenue before John Gotti was Jojo Carrazzo and Ronnie Rowan Tupia. Those guys were the rock stars. We, they were the New York, the nineties, New York Yankees. Like they, that, that was it. They were Madison Square Garden. That was the Mecca. And then across Woodhaven Boulevard, down on 98, 99, 100, was John Gotti and his crew, right? But no one ever knew. Like, John Gotti was the guy. Gene Gotti was the guy. Can they, like, that whole crew was no joke. But then you had this guy, Ronnie Wong, that even before he was straightened out, he had 200 guys on the street. Anybody that got into a beef in Ozone Park, East New York, Woodhaven, with somebody, that person was always like, I'm with Ronnie Wong. I'm with Ronnie Wong. You know, and I'll preach that guy's name till the day I die. He was the guy. And I always said, if there was anybody that I would go into this life for. Now, I grew up around Vinny Asara's car. I know you know Vinny Asara was like the actor boss of the Banana Fam. I know Vinny my whole life. My mother used to babysit his kids. Like, I grew up in that club on Fallwell Street in East New York. His club was in East New York. I was five years old, running fireworks out of there. So then, you know, my mother probably thought but never said it because she died in 91. She thought I was going to be a banana. But that wasn't happening because I knew at a young age, I was watching, I was sweeping up at six years old in one of the Korean stores and I would watch Ronnie come in with his suit and get, shake the place down. You know what I mean? Like, I'm like, that's the guy. If I'm never going to be in that life, I'm going to be with Ronnie Wano. And we used to fight the kids that I grew up with, the Irish kids I'm talking about. We used to fight. They were called 88 Park against Howard Beach. Now, Howard Beach was all wise guys' kids at the time. It was all Gambinos, Regerios. It was all wise guys, kids, not nephews, kids, like straight up. You put hands on them. Your father's going to come and clip you because that's how it was back then. But we were, we were the last park in Ozone, in Ozone Park that fought against them. And they just couldn't beat us. Hospital, stabbings, baseball. It was bad. So John Gotti's youngest son, Peter, who I was very good friends with, tough as can be, I don't care what anybody says, finally called the truce. And we went down to his club, which used to be his Uncle Richie's club. It's right around the corner from his father's club. I was 18 years old. And we squashed the beef finally. It was like a beef that went on for tw His brother, John, used to fight against the older kids when he was younger. Like, it was that bad. Like, it went back generations. And it finally came to an end. Now, before that, I'd never even stepped foot in Howard Beach. Now I got a condo. I'm living there. Like, I didn't even know the area. And it's only, it's walking distance from my house. We just never went into Howard Beach. That's just the way it was. So now I meet Peter and I'm meeting all the wise guys, kids now and everybody else. And who comes strolling in one day? Ronnie one I'm son Al. And I loved Peter. We were very close. We broke bread. But there was just something that drew me to him. And I didn't even know he was Ronnie's son. We thought this older kid was Ronnie's kid. We didn't even know that. And I grew up with his father since I was five years old. So... I get introduced to him. He's an athlete. I'm an athlete. He becomes a bookmaker. I'm working in Nikki Carrazzo's wire room at the time. I know the bookmaker business backwards and forwards. So we had a lot in common. And one day he invites me to a card game. He's like, oh, who do Because we played cards at seven days a week. That's all we did with our money at Bet Sports. So he invites me to a card game in Howard Beach. This is like my first, I didn't even know how to get there. Like, I don't even know. It's streets. It's, I'm like, I've never been to Howard Beach before. So I go there. And we're playing cards, and it's just like he, he only stood around certain guys. Very, I was one of those. I, I always told everybody, with me behind him, and I, ooh, he could have became the boss of the game, you know, fam. Very smart kid, very smart, very good, educated, 
he could have went on. Like he could have played baseball in college. He went to Christ the King, had great grades. He was a pitcher. He threw like 90 something miles an hour. Great athlete. So yeah. So now he's got me there. And it's only three, four guys because he kept his circle close and they were all smart. And then he takes me to a room. He goes, I'm making this into a bookmaking office. Kind of like, do you want, like out of nowhere, you know, like, do you want to join us? And then he invites me to play on their football team. And then all of a sudden now I stop hanging out with Peter and I'm hanging out with Al. And then his father lays down the law. Now we're going now with guys like that. Like you see in the movies, everybody's always eating. It's not like that. You have a sit down, you sit down and it's over. When you break bread with them, you're considered a friend. So a couple meetings, a couple strip clubs. We're not, we're on the 21. We're just hanging out. Then I get invited to his father's club. And then I get invited to eat. We break bread. Then I get invited to the house. So now it's building up. And then when he decides that he's going to straighten them out, he makes sure he's got a good crew around. Like very smart how he did it. And that's just how it felt. It was like, I'm going to be with his son. I'm going to protect his son, but he's going to be our captain. And that's how I'm going to get in. And that's like, I sat down with the guys I was working in the wild. And they're like, what are you doing on drugs? You're here. You're there. Nobody knows who you're with, what you do. You know, everybody. How's the guy, your next door neighbor is a captain of the game. How's he going to straight, you know, how's he going to shake you down? He knows he's sick your five. You know what I mean? And if they all mean, I've done favors for guys in the life, in, from every Colombo my whole life. Who do you can do in favor? This guy's bothering my sister or my girlfriend. Baseball bat, this, you know, fight this. I've done favors like that. So it was never looked at. So I had the chance to stay under the radar and make a hundred times more money than I could ever make being around these guys. And for some reason, I thought that was a corn. And that's the way it happens. You know, we were just Italian kids that met in Little Peter's social club, and now we're in each other's wedding parties. Now we get married at the same time. We all have kids that are the same age. We all got our wives all got pregnant at the same time. If like we weren't, you know, we were serious guys. We like we went to the movies. It was with our wives. We all did it together. It was like that, you know. If we went away, we went away together. It was so tight like that. And it just happens growing up in a neighborhood like that. It's like if you grow up with a bunch of doctors and you're all going to school, you're going to be pre-med. You know what I mean? It's just, I don't know. It's just, that's just the way that neighborhood worked 101st Street. And Howard Beach, as everybody knows, back then was a mafia breathing ground. You know, every boss, there was a boss that lived at one time in all five families lived in Howard Beach at one time together. Wow. And so how old were you, uh, 21, you said, or 18? 19. Well, I started hanging out at 18 with them, and 19 is when I got really close with them, and then it just took off from there. And we had a great run. We had a great one. We made a ton of money. We were rock stars. We were rock stars. Do you see the way they get treated in The Sopranos and all these other movies? They walk into places. They'd have our pastries ready, every pizza place, every restaurant, every nightclub, anything that was big. We went to China clubs on Monday, Life on Tuesday. Table service ready. Rappers couldn't get what we would. I remember even just the Finos one night. And I was with the Bananos. I wasn't even with the Gambinos. I went out with the Bananos one night. And they got the whole upstairs locked down. And Jay-Z comes walking in with two bottles of Cristal. And he's at one of the tables, like one of the tables, by himself. I remember he left one. Baby got angry. He left one bottle, walked out. We were the rock star. Like, they were, these guys weren't even doing bottle service yet in Miami the way we were. In Vegas, we took over places, Atlantic City. We were really doing it. Like, it, there's no movie. There's no show. They can glamorize the life, and they still couldn't compare to what we were doing in that life. You know, we had brand new cars every year at 18 years old. You were going out to buy a stainless steel Rolexes. We were wearing Prezi's and Masterpieces. Like, it was just insane. And we did it. We did it out in the open. We didn't have jobs. We wanted to be known as the mafia. We wanted that. Take pictures of us because we knew – yeah, was gonna, we were all going to jail. That was like the first thing when we sat down to break bread. You are all going to jail. You are all going to get clipped. Your wives are going to get hit on. Guys are going to try to fuck your girlfriends. Don't expect help. You're in this life. This is, you know how people say, oh, they're supposed to take care of you. No, like Ronnie was good. Like, like they let you know. This, no, this is the streets. It's every man for himself. You go to jail, don't expect nobody to help you unless you got a good friend that's going to do it or a family or this. Like build that, build that. Don't expect it from me or anybody else. You know, they go into that life. Well, let me take care of my family. Well, they robbed me for 10 million. Or they did. Yeah, it's the street. Like, these are criminals. Why don't anybody ever get that? We're not saints. We're not altar boys. They're criminals. Of course he's going to try to fuck your wife. Of course he's going to steal your money. There's no honor amongst these. 
I was just going to say that. There but you people go. don't get that. <laughs> but these guys did. And they said that to you. If you're expecting a different outcome, Hootie, go get a job at the MTA. UPS is hiring. This ain't for you. Go back into the street, sell drugs, and tell on your connect. This life, you're going to jail and you get flipped. That's the end of it. It's not the 60s and 70s. It's DNA. There's electronics. There's this. There's that. Like, you know, and I think if everybody, and that's probably why we had, we didn't, within our tight crew, that generation that they came from, from East New York, and they didn't have us, they didn't have an informant for like 100 years because that's how they told you. We don't want you. You want us. Like when you've seen the movies, you know, peer pressure. I never seen any of that growing up in, the, in the organized crime. Peer pressure or, or go out and do this for me. You had to make a splash for them to want you. You wanted to be with them. They didn't want you. We got enough guys trying to get into the mafia. We ain't going around looking for people. You know what I mean? Like, and your thing is, the less the better. More money for us. We don't need more guys in our crew. You know, it's like that. And I think, it, and that's why I, that's why I come on any, and I tell them all the respect I have for my mentors and people in the life because they told me how it was. Get the fuck out. Go get a job. I came home from jail. My closest friend in the world now, my closest friend in the world, like I had friends that, every one of my friends got straightened out. Everybody was a wise guy. But my closest friend in the world gets straightened out while I'm in jail. I come home. He's the first person I see. You know what he tells me? He hands me an envelope full of money. Says, because, you know, go buy a car, get a lot, go get a fucking job. I'm like, you're not starting a crew? You just got straightened out two months before I got out. You're not starting. Go get a fucking job. This is the, my closest friend in the world just became a wise guy. I got a fucking pass to steal from the mall. You, know, you could beat bookmakers. We could sit down all over New York and just beat everybody now. And he told me, go get a fucking job. It sounds like they all kept it real with you. All of they, them. Everybody from my Irish friends to my Jewish friends, to my Italian friends to being in the life always kept it real with me. I can't blame any of them. I can't say it's their fault. They all said it. Build a life, build a war chest, insulate your family, you know, and it all comes from Gotti walking out Castellano. That opened up a door. I, I haven't spoken about this with anybody. I wrote it to keep the notes for my book, but we were told, you know, like you're always supposed to say the life comes first if you're on the if your father's on his deathbed of your wife and we call you come. Well, after Gotti did that for his family and friends, that put the crew before the family. So we were part of the Gotti regime. Like even though I wasn't with the guys, I was with Ronnie. That was all the Gotti regime. They were all Gotti's guys going down the line. We were still living in that Gotti regime because then Junior took over and then the Uncle Peter took. So it was still the Gotti regime. And that's how, so it was the crew comes first, then the life, then your family. So if you keep the crew tight, you keep it real with the crew, we're not going to let nobody send for you and whack you out. We're not going to do this. We'll rise up. And we were so powerful. Like when you see in the movies, these guys that make fun of the younger guys, the older guys loved us, respected. I sat down with the Sicilians. I sat down with the bosses. They loved us. We were the best dressed, the best looking. We ate at the best restaurants. They, they had nothing. And, we, and they always said, these guys are the next come, come in, they're the earners. We had two, 300 guys on this. I had 100 guys on the street. You know what I mean? That I could have called, that I did business with, that I worked with, that I you know made money with, that I grew up with. So nobody in organized crime would ever go against our crew. We were the toughest. We were the strong. And we wouldn't let anybody from outside our crew, within the family, or the other families, hurt anybody with our crew. Like, we would die for the guys in our crew first, and then the family. Because that's the way Gotti did it. Gotti took care, whacked out the boss, whacked out anybody that was going to hurt his childhood friends or his family. That wasn't about money. That was about friends and family. So a lot of families didn't take that. You know, like, you hear Michael talk about how Sonny walked out of his sit-down that we're going to let him get whacked. We were, I wouldn't let my next-door neighbor get whacked. You know, I stuck off for guys... I guys that got that they sent me to get that I knew were going to get stabbed or really badly hurt. I gave them money and sent them to Florida. I, I wouldn't leave, I wouldn't let I wouldn't bring guys in like that. I would never be that guy. You know, hearing Sonny did that. From, I mean, I heard it from Mike. You know, Michael said it that his own father was going to let him get whacked out because the Colombo family was just a whacked out family anyway. But I could, we would never let that happen. You know what I mean? Like we knew, like when guys were getting, you know how they, they make that whole. A lot of people don't know this either. We were so in with the families and the higher ups and everybody. We knew the days guys were going to get straightened out, which nobody's ever supposed to know. It's secret. They pick you up. You think you're getting whacked. 
I like when my when my closest one of my closest friends gets made, he knew the day he wanted to pick up the suit, the watch, what he was gonna drive, what he was gonna wear. So they let him know a week before. You know, like that never happens. And anybody's ceremony, nobody ever knows. We all knew when every guy in our crew was gonna get straightened out. We knew where to be afterwards, we know where we were gonna drink, where we were gonna eat to congrats. And nobody ever knows that. You know what I mean? So we were, we were, it was, listen, it was great until it wasn't, you know? And it's not that I'm glorifying it. I don't care how it was to anybody else. If anybody else could ever come on and talk honest, they would. The problem is they don't. They give you that whole, I'm a coward. They robbed me. They did this. They did that. They're fucking criminals. What did anybody expect? I, I just don't get that when people say that they robbed me for 10 minutes. What do you think? They weren't? You're in jail. You can't get to them. They're going to bring that money to your family? Life-changing money? Come on. Never happens. But don't you think like those people, when they're they're being told something else, right? Different than your experience, right? It sounds like you had uh, people that were very straight up with you and said, listen, this is what it is. You know what I mean? You're going to end up in jail. But Anthony, don't you think that it may be necessarily wasn't their fault you know they're trusting you know their higher ups they're trusting the people that are telling them we're going to look after your family we're going to take care of you when you go in or do you think they should have known better and they should have just been like yeah like i shouldn't depend on you know, their word you know it's very easy to answer since the 80s you have seen documentaries on a and e about bosses telling about people's wives getting hit on people's money they know it's going to happen. They've seen it happen to their friends. You don't need to say that, well, this guy sold me a dream. Well, you also know that the boss sold them a dream and then he told them that. Like you, you see it happening throughout the life, so you know what's going to happen to you. You're not, you're not in this life to be – they're not dumb. Nobody's dumb in this life. As much as they make them look like idiots on TV shows, nobody's dumb in this life. You just can't beat the government. Local cops never get anybody. The government you can't beat, Right. So you know that's going to happen. You've seen it happen. If you're in the Bananas, you've seen it happen to the Columbus. You're watching it happen in the 80s. And come on. Look, these guys, there was one murder on the Windows case in the 80s, the one that they used Rico against. Bruno and Delicato, his father was Sonny, the one that got whacked. He was the only one charged, which everybody in to the early 2000s didn't even know that nobody was charged with. He was charged with Carmine Galente's murder, right? Him, he was the only person facing a murder on the Windows case, on the Windows case, they gave the bosses a hundred years apiece, right? A hundred years apiece for stealing two dollars a window. They got a hundred years apiece. He got twenty years for murder. He came home. He's living his life. These guys got a hundred years apiece. Where do you where do you think anybody's playing fair in this life? How do you give these old men for stealing two dollars a window from the projects in New York City? A hundred years apiece for running a criminal enterprise, ongoing corruption, and you gave the guy who committed murder of a high, of a boss of a family twenty years. How does stealing money trump kill, taking somebody's life? You know, you can't win at this life. You can't win. And this is nineteen eighty. Like we're not talking about you know bosses and guys were flipping way before in the seventies, and it's just. With the media and the way we evolve now as a country, we see it more. There's not more rats today. There was just as many back then as there is today. It's just more public today. So you've seen all of this. Like the whole point is there wasn't a rat on that. Well, the one guy wasn't even a main guy that got 100 years for all the bosses and the family, just a regular guy. But my point is we see this evolving. So you can't sit here and say, oh, I didn't know they were going to rob me. Oh, they're trying to fuck my life. What are you talking about? It's 1999. They've been doing it for 30 years. You didn't think it was going to happen to you? Come on, that's just an excuse. It's just an excuse. I go to jail. I expect people to hit on my wife when they see her out. I go to jail. I expect people to steal my money. I don't care if it's for a year or 30 years. I expect that because the, we're not playing church choir. This is real life gangsters. And it's New York. It's not Vegas. It's not Chicago. It's not Cleveland. It's not New Jersey. This is the mecca of organized crime on underground gangland, New York City, the roughest, toughest, more murderers, killers, and drug dealers than anywhere. And you think they're going to come up there with the priest and bring you a bag of money? Like, well, <laughs> where are you living? So I, I just hate when I hear this shit in these interviews with these guys. They try to fuck my wife. They rob my money. Okay. So it's supposed to happen. Yeah. 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 And I think, I think with your guys, your mentors, they just said, look, this is what it is. 
take it or leave it. You like it, you don't. It doesn't matter. This is what it is. But uh, correct me if I'm wrong, because you said something interesting, like with the Gambinos and how now they put the, and I just want to understand this better. They put the crew in front of the life now. Was that because the Gambinos were so large that at some point there was an ambition from the higher ups of, we want to run all five families? Well, that always happens. That was, I don't know if, how this works is, Carlo Gambino was the boss of all bosses. That means he runs the whole five families. Capo to tutti capo, if you've ever heard that. That means the boss of all bosses. Then Paul Castellano got that. Then John wanted it. So where John was, he was back in um, Joey Scopo, which was going to be the underboss to Vicarina. Vicarina's fraction was going to take out the Persico fraction. Then John would have took out Vicarina and Joey Scopo would have became the boss. That's one vote for him to be boss of all bosses. Then, I don't know if you know this, but John was in talks with Joe Messina to change the name of the Bonanno family to the Messina crime family. No, they didn't know so that. then that becomes the Messina crime family. But what happens is first he's got to vote John in as the boss of all bosses and then John can have the power. So if that would have all worked out before John got pinched, he was trying to become the capo de tutti capo. What happened with why the crew before the family was John did it so we could do it. It was just an opening for people to say, fuck you, I'm going to protect my friends and family so we can earn more. My, my friends and family know that I'm going to protect them like that. We're going to earn 10 times more we would have earned if this is the way we were doing things. But now yeah. they know we're all protected. You get what I'm saying? That makes when sense, something yeah. happens, it's always an opportunity. You know, like somebody makes, like what just happened? You know, those those Oculus glasses, they made them 10 years ago, right? They were $230. That was just Apple's opening to make them better to charge 4000 So it's just an opening for people to do what be- everybody in all their earth prime. They do it to benefit themselves, nobody else. Nobody else, not the crew. Now, I'm making my crew exclusive because they're going to earn more money for me. Not because I want to protect them. I'm just making them think that so they earn more for me. The old saying is, I feed my guys enough to survive, but not too much where they don't need me anymore. So I make them think they're insulated and protected from the rest of the family, and they'll earn more for me. But we can do whatever we want anyway, because we're the toughest, roughest. You know, he was the most powerful Gambino captain in the whole family. Most guys on the street, in the streets, not involved in anything else. When you start moving away from the streets, you lose that power. Like Paul. Paul was away from the streets, so he lost that power. His underboss gave him up. You know what I mean? Street boss. So that's what happens. And, you know, that's just evolved, right? We all have to evolve with the time, right? They, you know, no more in the streets shaking down mom and pop stores because everything's going corporate. So we got to go online and steal money. You know, it just, evol- you know, organized crime just evolves into whatever direction, you know, the country goes in, the world goes in. That's just, you know, that's why the, the biggest gangsters in the world are the Balkans. I mean, you go up there, you know, never before was there billionaire gangsters. Now there's billionaire gangsters, the Balkans, the Albanians, you know, they just evolved with the country. They evolved with medical fraud, online fraud, you know, online drugs. You know, they just, those guys just took it to the next level, but they got to be on the run for the rest of their lives, like the Sicilian bosses, you know? So it's just with the times and like anything else. All the ethnic background, the Mexicans, the Albanians, they'll just replace the Italians. Yeah, that makes sense. And and you since you just mentioned Mexico and the Mexicans, you obviously have a very interesting story. Uh it was a oh, an, yeah. it was an ambitious time in your life. <laughs> we'll call it that <laughs> to say the least. Ambitious time and you 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 have this idea you want to hook up with one of the cartels down there and you yeah. sneak into Mexico. And then uh, you know, touch on also if you can, you said that when you had that meeting with that one guy that you really saw like, okay, this is for real. Like we're for real, but this is really on a different level and you didn't want to mix up with them anymore. What was it about them that you just said, this is a whole nother level of, and I don't want to get involved. Yeah. I mean, I was at my league. I didn't even get to meet with any cartels. I just met with a guy that was involved. One of the guys that just happened to be involved, maybe on the tail end that's happened to get out and all the gentlemen. But like, I'm like, I'm 19, I'm making money, I can do this, I'm dealing with a connector, a Dominican, you know, you, you do hear about, because, listen, 
you know, they talk about the Mexicans, how they kill your whole family. They take the bliss. They don't realize I've been hearing those stories my whole life. The Sicilians are the ones that started it. The Sicilian necktie came before the Colombian necktie. You know what I mean? Like they used to kill the whole bloodline on the boy's side. So they couldn't produce any men to go out and get revenge against whoever hurt them. Like that's a, the Sicilians did that since the beginning of time. They take out the whole family on the male side. bloodline. Like that's just been, you know, in the front of the whole town, they kill your family. So I know that, you know that we hear it, but it's like anything else that your parents used to tell you. You get a big plate of food that you absolutely love. You're like, put more, put more. Your eyes are bigger than your appetite. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, my, I'm pushing a key here, 10 keys here, my biggest deal. You know what I mean? Now I'm thinking I'm going to go into Mexico and get maybe 10,000 less a key, but I'm not realizing you got to take 50, 100, 1,000 a month. Like I'm not even on that level. You see it in the movies, you hear it, but you just, that's it. I'm a tough guy. I'm a gangster. I'm in the streets. I'm ready to hurt. You know, you get these things that people tell you in the streets and you're passing all those tests. Let's go to Mexico. Like I brought somebody with me who could spoke Spanish and they didn't even give that guy respect. You know what I mean? He was dark as the ace. Like, it's just, it's a different world. It's a different world. And I almost went into Juarez. Now I heard about Juarez, but this is, you know, it's the nineties. So it is really not publicized that, the cops don't even go into Juarez. Like, I didn't even know that yet. Like, they hang people from the bridges in Juarez. And I'm a gringo. The first thing they're going to do is try to get money for my family. And then once they realize I'm poor, they're going to just start sending body parts all over Mexico. Like, I'm not even thinking like that. So we wind up hooking up. Thank God I did bring somebody who spoke Spanish. but And they detoured us out of Juarez. And I met an old guy on a farm. And he was something of like a Sicario, like a retired Sicario, like that. And he sat me down. One, he knew I was Sicilian. Like, I mean, I was even talking even worse with my hand and everything. The, the, the tanks are the greatest things in the world. And he gave me the greatest story. You know, like, even if they were going to deal with a gringo, he wouldn't be Italian. He wouldn't be like you. You're probably involved in organized crime. You'll bring more heat. At the first meeting you go to, they'll chop you up into pieces. Like, this is not even going to work for you. Do yourself. And then, you know, he broke the whole thing down for me. We didn't take a thousand keys a month. What's that? I'm like a thousand keys a month. What's that? I'm like 10 keys a week. He's like 10 keys a week. He's like, why'd you even cross the border for that? Like, you know, like got, I got my first kick in the ass lesson, you know, like get the fuck out of here, kid, you know? And he schooled me on that, you know? And like I said, I came back in and it was just like, all right, you know? And then that's when I got into, I went to Canada and got into the weed business. And it was just, you know, it was an eye opening. And it was everything that you'll hear now in movies and TVs, but back in the 90s before any of this stuff was really public. You know, you can't do this. They won't work with you. They pay, you know, like I didn't even know the, you know, the story. They gave the kid $100 that got on the plane, obligated the kid like $100 of American money it came out to, to get on the plane with the bomb that blew up all them people. He's like, if they got a kid that's going to do that, in Mexico, it's even worse. hundred dollars, send their kids anywhere. They'll take out your family, your friends, your girl. They'll just come to America and just stop blowing things up for this guy for hundred dollars. Like that's how poor it was back then. I mean, it's still like that. You know what I mean? And then looking back on it now, seeing all the footage from back then, it's like, how did they even make it out? I could have just walked into that one wrong person. And I had a lot of money on me. You, know, I didn't, you couldn't see it. I wasn't flashing it. But they would have chopped me up for a hundred dollars, nevertheless for fifty thousand, like that I brought with me, and it was just insane. You know, I, I'm a cat. You know, I grew up Roman Catholic. I do believe in God, and I thought that day God was with me. You know, because it don't make a difference how tough you are. It don't make a difference if you're with the biggest gangster on a hundred the first day of you. They don't give a fuck. They'll cut you up for a hundred dollars. You're, you know, you're out of your league to get even introduced to a cartel member. Get your, rid of your accent. Get rid of your New York attitude. Like, you know, it's not even going to work. They won't even sit down with you or talk to you. And back then, it was more controlled by the Colombians. Now Mexico's their own cocktails. You know what I mean? Back then, they were like street gangs. They controlled territories, blocks, neighborhoods. Now they're more distinguished, more organized. Because they learned from the Colombians, you know? Yeah, on that God point, it's everything you're saying. That's all I was, I've been thinking about. I don't know about you, but it's like, 
you were, it seems like, yeah, you're in that life, but at the same time, you're getting people that are coming to you, warning you, telling you and mentoring you and almost trying to persuade you not to be in that life. If that makes sense. And as you said, nobody is stupid in that life. I don't think you made that choice, right? You're right. You're, listen, that's a good observation. Because I think the only person that ever pushed me towards that life was my mother. <laughs> Anybody else that I ran into, neighbors, watch me play baseball. Like, man, you should play baseball in life. Forget about the streets. So, like, I can't tell you how many. I remember, and this is two situations. Two guys in my crew get straightened out now. Like, two of them are straightened out. We're at a professional boxing match, a big boxing match. And it's the whole crew, my mentor, Ronnie. Like one of the first nights out, we're out as wise guys, everybody. We run into the bananas. And everybody in the bananas is straight now. They're wise guys. There was uh, two captains. And one of the kids that was an acting captain, a little older than me. I was the last one. Everybody said hello. We went, they went to their table. And I was the last one. And he grabbed me. He goes, you're in it now, huh? He's like, the best advice I could do is try to find a way out. Get the fuck away from these guys. Now, a lot of people would take that because I didn't choose the bananas or I didn't hang But I, like, I, this guy was an active captain. I know him since I'm six years old. You know what I mean? And he's telling me to get away. You know, because what happens is one of them, you know, two guys were straightened out plus my captain. One of them just got straightened out. So they had to be introduced as a friend to the bananas. Couldn't just shake their hand. So they were introduced as friends. And I was like the last one because I wasn't. You know, and he you know, he goes, you're in it now. He goes, try to find a way to fuck out of it. Meaning like you're going to get straightened out and it's going to be too late. You know what I mean? And I took that as like, all right, the following weekend, I go to a Gambino wedding in the Bronx. And an old school guy, I don't want to mention his name. He passed away now, but he's from the Dottie regime. Finally gets straightened out. He should have been straightened out years ago. His father was a captain. And he grabs me at the wedding. He got, he got introduced. He was just straightened out. So at the end, I always congratulate him anyway. You know what I mean? So I know, I says, congratulations. He's like, what are you congratulating me for? He goes, I wouldn't never took this if it wasn't for my father. He goes, but you got to get the fuck out. He goes, you got to head on your shoulders. He goes, you're better than all these guys that are straightened out. He goes, you should have been straightened out before me because this is towards the end. He goes, you should have been straightened out before me. He goes, when are you going to learn? He goes, get the fuck out. And now this is a guy in the same family. You know, and He's part of the Gotti crew, and he's telling me this, and he's a lot older than me. And it's like, wow, he wound up passing away after that, you know, health issues. One of the best guys I've ever met. You know, that's why I, I got nothing bad to say about the guys that I came up with. You know what I mean? I met a captain in the Columbos, and I think he, he was semi-retired, whatever he was. The first week that I met this guy, a lot older than me, from the old school era, big earner, said to me, after a week of, because we were doing something together, after a week of knowing each other, and I'm a lot younger, he comes over to me and goes, man, you got a head on your shoulders. Why don't you get the fuck away from these guys? And I never told anybody, I'm running towards them. I don't want to run away from them. You know what I mean? Like, I chose it. And I can't tell you how many people told me to get away. Legitimate people, business owners, my friends that became millionaires off of legitimate businesses, unions, everything else. Like, I got to say, like, you know, I had the red flags everywhere. I wanted it. I can't, you know, say it enough. It chose me. I had my chance when I was making big money to get away from it, but still being in the streets, I'd probably be dead or in jail anyway, but I would have made a lot more money if I lived a lot longer, but I would have been away from that life. And I had the chance and I, you know, I didn't take it, you know, and I, I, you know, I hear these stories from other people and I'm like, how can I have so many people telling me to get out? And, you know, you guys never had that. I got to think they had had somebody in their life telling them to get out. Well, maybe, you no, know, the other thing is if you talk to anybody in the life, I was very likable. I got along with everybody. I did business with everybody. I was friends with everybody. I tried to help everybody. I never tried to fuck anybody. There was always enough money to be made. So I thought, but a lot of these guys in the life never seen real money. So that's why they get greedy. That's why they don't help other people. They never seen real money. They never went out there and really got it. They always depended on other people. I went out, I seen real money. I knew what real money was about. And I thought there was enough for everybody. So I got along with everybody. I really, I didn't have enemies like, the guys in my crew, they really didn't like anybody outside our crew, outside the family. I got along with everybody. Guys in the Bronx, guys in Brooklyn, guys in Jersey. Didn't make a difference if they were Lucchese, Genovese, Gambino. Didn't matter. It's almost like two themes that I that I see, and I, I don't want to make it a religious podcast, but, it, it, you know, 
the man upstairs has a plan for you. Like it, there was all these things and he's protected yeah. you this whole time. And number two, it's almost as if, uh, you know, when they say reverse psychology, all these people telling you, get away from me, get away. And as you said, you're running towards it. Int very interesting. Very interesting. Well, and I mean, either one of you is going to have it, right? When you get your mind made up about something, right? So you set goals. Like people don't have A, B, and C plans, right? I was always that guy. I grew up poor. I didn't have anybody to run to to help. I always had a plan A, B, and C. So my plan A was like, listen, I'm going to stay in the street for as long as I can. I'm going to make money. I'm going to, you know, make friends, not enemies. You know what I mean? And then if I have the chance to go into the life, I'm only going to go into the life. With, like I had a plan. If I'm going to get into life, it's going to be with this guy. So to me, I'm following the path. I met his son. He likes me. We get along, play ball together. We started teams. We have a bookmaking. We did this. So it's like, it seems like that's, it's happened in the way plan A, B, and C was supposed to happen. You know, like I remember when we all got pinched on the big case. We were we were together for the last time at booking, and my friend, who was a captain now, says to all of us, "We'll probably never see each other for the next. We'll probably won't see each other for the next twenty years. Everybody, keep the head up, take care of your families, and we'll probably some of us will probably not even get along anymore. Like we knew the reality of it, and we never seen each other since that day. You know, I mean, it's fifteen years later, whatever. Like we always went into things like that." You know, we were all sitting around two years before we got pinched and said, when they come, none of in my crew was a drug dealer but me. But the way they made money, the way they spent money, we used to always say when they come, they're going to come like we're dope. Like we used to say, Papanya. We're going to come like the way Papanya dealers, they're like gangbusters. They're going to come at us like we're dope, dope dealers. That's the way they're going to come. Not like we're organized crime, not book making, not jukeboxes, not, you know, uh, blackjack machines, not card games, they're going to come like with Baba Anya did. That's how they're coming for us. And they're going to give us a fucking, they're going to give us, we used to say football numbers. Football numbers is like 56 years, you know what I mean? 33 years. It's, and we we would we would sit around and talk about this while we're breaking bread. You know, I was away from them for six years because I did I did two years, then I came home and I was on three years post-supervision. So I was away from them and they were doing paroles. This was all state bids for little stuff. And I was away from them. And we were sitting down and having dinner after not talking for almost two years just because of legal things. And we go right back to our conversations. Yeah, they'll be here. They're going to forget about these little state bids. The feds are going to come and they're going to come like my papa and you We're driving Lexuses. Now we're driving because it was a thing. You don't drive anything far and you don't drive Mercedes. You know, you don't, you know, stealth wealth. I wasn't a stealth. I'd wear Gucci and look across my chest if I could. They would wear stealth wealth like Brioni, take six. $10,000 suits, $5,500 suits, but you wouldn't see it. You wouldn't know it. You know what I mean? Wearing a white gold Rolex that looks like a stainless steel. You know what I mean? Like they, It was out dressed up well. The rest of us, I was showing off big. I didn't care. You know, but you couldn't get a Mercedes. Like there was, we had rules to it. You know, when you got pinched, you stood with your family, stood away from the life. You didn't come to the social clubs. You obeyed. You know, you never ran. Like when you see Tony running in that scene when John gets pinched, Mob guys never run. You're not, you're not a fucking clown. You're not a coward. You sit there, you get pinched, you get bailed. You don't get bailed. You fight your case. You stay away from everybody in the street. Like, you know, when we went in, we had rule. Like, we sat down and smoked. This is how you act. This is what you do. I only had kids and got married. I, I forbid to get married or have kids. I was in the streets. I was dating every girl. I was, I loved it. But they said, if you're going to be a part of this, you got to have a family. You got to settle down. You got to relax. You can't worry about what rock you're going to crawl out of tomorrow or the next day like like there was things and i because i started young you know and you get schooled by the right guys i got schooled by all the right guys you know what i mean i would have got married and had kids if it wasn't for the life i would have been single forever if it was up to me you know but that's like what you do you know and i followed that and to me it was an honorable thing because that's where i come from maybe p other people are honorable because they want to be lawyers or doctors like i always say that's honorable for them what i became what i am today and how i think what well, to me was honorable so that's just, you know, how I see things. Yeah. And I really wanted to ask you, Anthony, if you could talk to us a little bit about what it was like going on the inside. You know, we hear different stories of, you know, different experiences. What was it like for you? Did you have people kind of gun for you? Did you have, you know, en enemies, any like interesting stories that you think we'd want to hear about or anything, any fights you got into or anything like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the state and fed are totally different. You know, a lot of guys will take 20 years in the state before they take 10 years in the feds. 
You know, you get trailers, you get packages, you get visits, you get more freedom. There's no programs in jail. You can't go to school. You can't learn. You can't further anything in the feds. Upstate, you could become, you could work three jobs. I was working four jobs. I was, you know, upstate, which a lot of people don't get. Like when I went to Rikers Island, I was in the roughest buildings going. But you got to remember, I came from the streets of East New York. So I knew a lot of these gangs, these guys that became gang members and a lot of, so I was in the general population. I was in the Beacon. I was the only white guy in a lot of these buildings, but I was Italian and the Gambinos do have a stronghold on Rikers Island at one time. So the beefs I got into were personal beefs, never got jumped, you know, sitting in the GP cell being the only white guy. There's 500 guys fighting, standing. It's crazy. And nobody fucked with me, you know? Plus I was a fighter. I fought all the time. I had a good reputation with the blacks and the Hispanics. I got along with the bloods. I got along with the land kings. Crips I had a little problem with, but a lot of people had those problems. But we had a lot of the COs. They were from the streets. They bring us in food, no drugs. We didn't get involved. That was one thing. You stood away from drugs and gambling when you were in. Like, like I said, we had rules, but we got Italian bread. We got salami. You know, we had a lot of, because they knew that we were never going to tell them. We would never ruin our connect. You know what I mean? Because it had to be for other game, you know, guys that came in there, you know? But a lot of, throughout over the years, it was, Feds, 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 feds. So there wasn't a lot of mob guys going to jail, but we held a lot of respect in state prison. I got upstate, formed my own crew. I was running a medium with two. I, all I needed was, you know, you ever hear so you just need two Italian guys who roll over and take over the water, like comedians. It's true. I got with two guys from Staten Island and we ran the whole yard. They had bloods, crips, like kings. But that's how strong you get with other Italians. Like we could just take over, you know, our smarts. We come from the streets. You can't take them over with two bankers or two lawyers, but you get two other street guys, three street guys walk in the yard. No one's going to mess with you. You know what I mean? It was like, I mean, we had a handball game. It was me and another guy did. The whole court was bloods. We beat them. The whole court was like a hundred bloods on the court. And it was just me and this one Italian kid. And we were the two guys to beat. And these two bloods came in. We beat them. But everybody was against us. They were trying to trip us, the ball out. But, you know, we didn't get beat up. We didn't get jumped. We won. And, that was us. It was three Italian guys and nobody fucked with us. You know what I mean? We had like the upstate white guys were trying to, you know, get with us, but we wouldn't, you know, we, you know, like they wanted to be down with us. They were getting shaken down. They were getting their, you know, their buckets taken, meaning their commissary. You know, I went in on a violation once and I'm on a violation. I get pitched on an assault. I go to Rikers Island. Now, when you get pitched in Queens, they take you to the boat. They call it the love boat. No, but nothing's going on there. And White guys usually want to stay there. Me, right away, I'm making complaints. I want to go to Rikers Island. I want to be in general population. Like, what are you, crazy? Like, stay here and nothing's going on. No fights. I'm like, fuck you, this place. Nobody moves. There's no yard. There's no nothing. It sucks. But that's where people want to be because they're afraid of trouble. Not me. Boom, Rikers Island. They pull me out one day. They send me to Rikers Island. I go to the five building. I've never been in the five building before. Five building's like a drug building. But it's got the most red lights, the most stabbings. It's the roughest building. I'm thinking it's a drug building. I'm like, I got to get myself transferred somewhere else now because there's nothing to be do here. It was the wildest building I've ever seen. Stabbings. You can't move during a red light. There was more red lights every day than any building I've ever seen. It was nuts. So I'm like, all right, this is a little bit better. So I get to the place. I get to the place. And you have to check your phone to see if you got money. You have to go on and put your, your, you know, your number in. And it tells you you got $20 credit, whatever it was. And it was starting to be slot time. And we were going, they, this house was going to um, commissary the next day. Now I got to get a haircut ticket. I got to get soups. I need peanut butter. I got nothing. So I'm checking to see if they put money in my account yet. And I picked up the phone during somebody's slot time. It was a young blood kid. So right away, he puts a beef in, in the house or whatever it was. They call me into the bathroom. And... He was just mad, right? Now, I just got there. He doesn't, I don't know. So there's like five or six bloods in the house. And they see me talk. They see me stand up. And his big homie's like, all right, no one's going to jump you. Just fight him a fair one for touching his phone. So I'm like, all right. So I had this Spanish kid that was dope sick sleeping next to me. But I kind of took care of him on the bus ride over. And when he see me go in there, he was from the Lower East Side. He came in and stood with me. So I fought the kid. And he first he got the best of me. Then I'm getting the best. Of, now there's a window here. The CEOs let you go for like two minutes, fight, just so they because they let you run the house. That's how it works on Rikers Island. 
So we're going and like two, three minutes. Now I'm getting the best of them like the last minute and I'm thumping them. So like, all right, break it up as soon as I start. So he had one kid that was really close to them. And, you know, he, he got a kidney shot on me when he went to break it up. He grabbed me and hit me in the kidney shot. I was like, oh, my God. So it looked like I was, you know, I couldn't breathe for like two minutes. You know, and I was fresh off the street on a violation, on an assault charge. You know, that's how if you present yourself well and not even if they think you're a mafia, but they kind of thought that's how they'll treat you. But if you go in there and you look like just a regular white guy and you're trying to be something, they would have probably stabbed me or shanked me. But how I presented myself and I was willing to fight and I did fight, they didn't. You know, the big homie broke it. Yeah, his friend got a shot in. You know, it was unfair. But that's like the kind of worst and a bad building. I was like, you know, guys, red tags mean stabbing. These guys don't have red tags. That means they stabbed somebody or they got into a real bad beat. So things like that happen. You know what I mean? And in the feds, it's a lot more. There's more Italians. There's more whites. So you kind of get the clique that you eat with so they know they fuck with you. And you might not have guys in the clique that are willing to fight, but they think they are, so they'll leave you alone. So that's like the difference. In the state, you're kind of on your own, but they don't fuck with you as much. You know what I mean? And if you get one or two guys, that's it. You can take over a jump, you know? And that's how all my bits were. And that's just from me growing up in the streets and how I always presented myself, you know? And that's, no, I've had, my bids were all like that. Was there any close calls in the streets where you're like, I almost got caught slipping or? Oh, know? yeah. I, I mean, that's why I always go back to, I always got to believe in God. It was like three chances that I walked into a place at a tech night that I was supposed to get clipped and I talked myself out of another meeting that I was going to when I got one, two minutes before, they were going to rob me. They might have tied me up and killed me. You no know, Puerto Ricans I was doing business with. It was a lot of, yeah, just three times that I was supposed to get clipped and I didn't. And I always thank God for that. Like ADHD, I, that gave me that sixth sense to think and move maneuver out of that situation that I almost walked into. The one I couldn't get out of. I was already there. I was in a building and uh, I was with another kid and it came, you know, he was getting mad. I wasn't giving anything up. He probably would have shot me, but I found out years later, the kid that I was with set that up, you know, and I made a deal with the guy and I never went through with it, but just to get out of there. But if it would have went a little further, he had a tech nine in my chest. He probably would have shot. Me. That's intense. Yeah. Plastic. It was like a movie. He had plastic all laid out. You know, as soon as I walked into the apartment. Wow. Yeah. There was a, there was a few chances. There was a chance that I went into a situation with three, two captains and a wise guy, they had three kids, that I almost got them into a situation. I had to worry about these three guys coming to clip me because their kids would have been stuck in a situation that I was in. We were all just hanging out. And I ended up in a place that I shouldn't have been in. And there was people there that I had problems with, and they would have suffered with me, and it, it just would have been bad. And this was back in the 90s, so they were still clipping, guys. So that's what I was going to ask regarding the, the mafia because you were involved with drugs and they, that was always a no, no for a lot of them. It's like, were you ever fearing for your life from, you know, potential threats from the mafia? Cause you were doing drugs, like selling drugs. It held me back from a lot of things. They never put me on record. I was never on record with the Gambino family. That's why I never thought I would get pinched in a Rico case. Cause I was never on record with them and it was known, but my contribution to the crew was nobody else could touch drugs. So nobody outside the family really knew what drugs I was selling. If it was pharmaceuticals, marijuana, coke. They always would figure it out. So that was kind of hard. But my captain knew because my job within the crew was to shake down drug dealers for him. So I took over his drug dealing. Like a lot of people think, so like growing up, he was known as the biggest drug dealer in my neighborhood. So I always thought he was this big time heroin dealer. And when I got around him, he didn't know the first thing about any drug. He never dealt drugs. He shook, his thing was shaking down guys in the street because drug dealers feared him. So all he did was shake down drug dealers, so they made him a drug dealer. He was never a drug He went away for you know life for selling drugs, and he never, he didn't know the first thing about drugs. He shook down drug dealers. Therefore, with the RICO Act, you become a drug dealer. It, the way it works, it's this, I tell you, if you really look at it, it's the scariest thing in the world. You wouldn't even rob a pack of gum, the way RICO works. So my job was, they weren't going to pay anybody else in the crew these drug deals, but I had a reputation in the streets, so he used that. So now I can go around because he was a made guy at the time. Then he became a captain. So he couldn't do that no more. So now I, my job was to go to Brooklyn, Queen, and shake down all the drug dealers. I guess so, it kind of made sense that way. It benefited yeah. you both, right? Yeah, he was a smart guy. He, 
he knew how to move the chess pieces on the board. You know what I mean? Put me right. in the crew with all these Ivy League kids that grew up around his son. These are all, these are all silver spoon. You know, we call them third base. A lot of people don't know about that. Meaning you're born on third base. You know what I mean? Like you got everything handed to you. You just gotta walk on home. You know, guys like us were born at the plate. Hmm. So those guys would never get the respect of the guys in the streets or the drug deal. I had so many years growing up with them, and they knew, you know, that I, I didn't play around when it came to that. So it was a lot, you know, it was easy. They, they you know, you know, that's the one. That's why when I watch these things and they make guys with their wingtip shoes and their, I'm like, you have no idea how smart these guys are. These guys grew up in the gut. Like the real guys grew up in the gutter in the streets. They had nothing. Nothing matters to them. They learned. They pulled themselves up from the bootstrap. These guys lasted 40, 50 years in the streets before they got pinched. Without Rico, none of these guys would be pinched. You couldn't get these guys on anything if Rico didn't exist. And they make them out to be idiots on TV. Yeah, and um, when you're when you're going around now and you're seeing some of these figures, like who was a figure that you know you had heard of, and when you finally saw them, if if this ever happened, you finally saw them and were like. Whoa, that's the real deal. I heard of him, and, and and his reputation already precedes him. Did you ever bump into someone like that or meet someone? No, they I already knew the real guys growing up before I got into the life. I knew guys, you know, I knew guys that were shooting people and guys that didn't, and their rep. You knew the guys that had bodies. That's just the way you grew up. You know what I mean? I know this guy had three bodies. I knew this guy had four bodies. Um, you know, they were all you know like I. I there's nobody that surprised me. I knew the guys that had bodies. I knew the guys that didn't. Um, oh, you know, coming out now, which he was the real deal. He was in the streets. He was a powerful captain. I'm not taking nothing away from him. He's one of the only guys that you can believe every one of his stories. He sat down, Mikey Scars. We thought Mikey Scars was a stone cold killer from Brooklyn to find out he never killed anybody. He just made a great reputation on being an acting tough and people took that as a serious thing. But there's nobody that sat down with more people, that were with more bosses. He created the new life in the Gambino family as a powerful captain. He gets all the credit. Don't take anything away from him. The only thing was back in Queens, we thought this guy was a stone cold killer. We thought he had bodies. The way that the Gambinos talked about him, we thought this guy was a, like the up and coming. Like he was the next guy. He like this guy is killing people, burying people. He's no joke. And then it was just all an act. He didn't kill anybody. Wow. So Probably the you, only one. So did you guys like still respect him to that same magnitude? No, or we didn't find really? out till, till we didn't find out till after he flipped. Okay, got he it. Didn't plead to no bodies. Let's talk, let's talk about the, the the flipping and the cooperation and and however you, people want to phrase it because one of we get so much hate on towards some of our guests that we've had on our YouTube channel. And I respond to all the comments for those of you guys still listening and watch. I respond to the comments, <laughs> be nice on YouTube. Okay. <laughs> and so they're responding and they say some crazy stuff about certain guests and specifically about like the ratting and the snitching and this and that. And then when you talk to the guest and you ask them about it, um, everybody tries to justify it, you know, in their own way and rationalize in their own mind, why they did or said what they did. So you you speak with um, someone who goes, yeah, I never I, I never sent anyone to jail. I just gave information on you know some things that I thought I knew about or whatever the case may be. Uh, then you get other guys who go, well, he was flipping on me, so I said I want to flip on him, and and you know there was no loyalty. So like, where do you stand on all of this? And My outlook is totally different. My outlook is no one's ever spent a minute in jail because of me. But I'm on here talking. I'm no good. Bottom fucking line. If I'm telling one story about the street, there's no justification. Now, if you pricked your finger and you had a saint burnt in your hand, I don't care what anybody did to you. You take the lethal injection because that's you. You took a blood oath. You take the lethal injection. You take life in prison. I don't care if they fucked your wife. I don't care with this. I got family. I got kids. You took the oath. This comes before your wife being pregnant. This comes before your father being on a deathbed. You took that. Now, anybody outside taking that oath, you should have never trusted with information that can put you in jail. That's just how I feel. If anybody's on here talking, everybody's no good. There's no justification on a guy that took a blood oath in a secret society that going back 2,000 years that should ever have to say, 
they did this to my wife. They did this. You took the oath that they can do that. And none of that matters. This comes before that. Right? You know, I mean, now you know the oath. A lot of people didn't know the oath back then, like outside of being straightened out. So people should figure that for themselves. The blood oath is this comes before your family. That means you shouldn't have kids. You shouldn't have a wife. Your father's death shouldn't matter to you. All your money being taken away from you shouldn't matter because this comes before that. So when you take this oath, that's what that means. You go to jail for the rest of your life. You die for this. Listen, the Japanese fall on their swords. They cut pinkies off his ceiling or lying. Like these are oaths. So the people that took an oath, I got no respect for. I don't care. No, it's a different world. I'm, I, I'm not here to judge. So I don't care. That's just how I feel. You took an oath. You die in this. I don't care what they did to your family. It's just the way it is. You took that oath. That comes before. Oh, it changed. It did this. When you took the oath, did the oath change? The life is different today. Then why'd you take the oath? You could say, no, the life is different today. Back then, if you said, no, you got clipped. Back now, you could say, no. You could have said, no, in the last 30 years. No, I don't need it. Life is different. I don't respect it anymore. Don't say... I change because the life changed. No, the oath didn't change. Your 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 honor and your loyalty to the thing of ours didn't change. People change every day. Don't do business with them. Don't do business with the people that you think change. Don't do business. Well, I didn't know he was like that. Then you didn't belong in the streets. You can't figure somebody out knowing that person. I I remember walking in saying that guy's a scumbag. I remember you know my. Older people say, he'll be a rat one day. That guy's no good. That guy, and he picked, you, he knew every single, what every single one of them, he goes, I, I won't even talk to that guy because I know he's going to go bad in 10, 20 years whenever he gets caught doing My crew was like that. Like, you you know, guys, if you don't know, then whoever proposed you didn't know. Whoever put you up. You know, and that's just my thought on the life. Not to, whatever, it doesn't mean nothing. I'm not a main guy. I'm not in the life. I'm a commentator. I'm a sideline guy. I'm a Monday morning quarterback. Whatever you want to call me. But 38 years I was in that life. I seen man. I seen what they become. You got to remember. It's all about the Gemini twins from the DeMeo crew. Those guys are in jail for the rest of their lives. Everybody did them wrong. But they're in jail doing the rest of their life. Ronnie won on. He went to jail on a case that he wasn't even in. And he got convicted on life in a state that he never stepped foot in. They convicted him in Florida. He never even stepped foot in Florida. And he's spending the rest of his life in jail because he took an oath to the life. That didn't matter. That this guy's no good. This guy ain't paying them no more. These guys believe in the oath that they took to the life, that blood oath. If you thought it was no good, you should have said no at the time. And that's just the way I look at it. you know. And I, ne I never heard anybody. But I'm on here talking about it, so I'm no good like the rest of them. Bottom line. That makes sense. I great wanna, perspective. Yeah. That's a really great perspective. But I just want to ask you, so let's say, for example, like somebody takes an oath, right? Like what do you have to say to someone that takes an oath and you know they 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 pledge their loyalty, and then let's say the the boss that you know pledges they pledge their loyalty to flips right, and they go against um, you know everything, and just so that they don't get life in jail, and then that person is like, okay, that doesn't make sense. Now they're not loyal to me. Why should I be loyal to them? What do you, what would you say to someone like that? Because honestly, like it it feels me. It wouldn't really make sense to go to life for somebody or for a family that he's a snitch. No, no, no. I have a question. He's a snitch. But like, if you're gonna no, face just, life, because you're not pledging loyalty to that boss, that guy might have not even have been the boss when you got pledged. It's the well, life you're pledging. It's it the life you're pledging yeah. to. That guy what that Anthony, comes after him. That guy. What you're, Anthony's you're, saying, there's like, never one man. You. No. So the first thing they tell you, no one man is above the life. The boss, nobody. Because you're pledging your allegiance to all five families at one point. You know what I mean? You're mm -hmm. pledging your allegiance to that life. With Maya Lansky and Charlie Luciano and these guys made nobody, you know, nights at a round table. Nobody sits at the head. You know what I mean? That guy, that boss is a CEO. It's a revolving door. You know what I mean? That boss is going to come and go. You feel a certain way because you grew up with that guy. He's the guy that made you. Yeah, that's fine. But you're told the life comes before anything. This guy here, he's the head of your family. He's the father. That's, but he's not bigger than the life. It's the life you're pledging to, but this is your father who you answer to. Everybody has to answer to somebody. Then that boss has to answer to a committee, right? Stock shareholders. You can put it anyway. I've put it into meetings with people that are CEOs and CFOs. 
into, I put it into like a, a business setting. So you got to answer to a board of directors, stockholders. You may be the CEO and the boss that your guys are answering to you beneath you, but then you take that and you got to answer to a board of directors, which is a committee, not one person. And that's how the mafia, that's why they structured it like that. Yo, the president turns around and gives information, Biden, his son, to China, whatever they do, I don't follow politics, but just say that happens. You're going to say the president failed me. You didn't even believe in that guy. A lot of people don't believe in the guy that, look, God, he didn't believe in Paul becoming boss. He believed in Neil. He didn't tell on him. He clipped him. You know what I'm mean? Like, that's the way it works. Not everybody's going to agree with who's the boss in the family, but he's the boss. So I believe in the life. So I got to believe in the guy that they put it in. You know what I'm saying? You don't believe in, not everybody believes in the CEO. You might like the CFO better than the CEO. You know, it's just, you know, and then, but there's people that love that guy. There was people that love that guy. The other families loved Paul. That's why they were so upset when he got clipped. But there was guys in the family that didn't. His own family didn't like him, but people on the outside, the stockholders loved him. But his own family didn't like him. His own guys didn't like him. His own team didn't like him. You know, so it's when you pledge, they make sure you pledge to the life because you never know who's always going to be sitting in that chair. That's true. Makes sense. It's also like, for example, in business, let's say we're, you know, trying to get a real estate contract and you got some person at a different company, you know, goes behind our back to that person and says, you know, these guys are this, this and that could be totally live, made up stuff. And then the guy comes to me and goes, this is what they said. Well, I have two options now. Stick to my guns and say, okay, they could say whatever they want. It's not true. But, you know, do you want to work with us? Or I could play that game too. And then that, what you're saying is that, well, you're choosing now to do that and play that game rather than sticking to your guns on who you are and what you've decided, how you've decided to conduct yourself. And I agree with that. Like, I would never be someone who would, you know, turn around and do something, even if they did it to me, I'd say, whatever, man, turn the other cheek. I'm not like that. They, they're cut from that cloth. I'm not like that. And I think that's what you're trying to say here, just as a Communism comparison. Communism and democracy. Yeah. yeah. Cuba, Fidel's in, in control for 9,000 years. The United States, presidents only get four years. You're not fighting for one person. You're fighting for a Congress, the community, you know, the board of directors. Communism is you only you only worship me, not even God, not Jesus. You worship Fidel. That's so it's democracy. You just spoke like a democracy, not communism. Me, there's nobody higher than me, not God, not Jesus, whoever, Allah, whatever. Nobody's bigger than me. That's communism and democracy is a whole. I'm going to take what I know. That's freedom. You don't have that in the communist country. You know what I mean? So that's exactly how the mafia worked as a democracy. It was a communism. Joe the boss, Joe Mezzeria, they, they wanted to just be one. They couldn't work together because they wanted the Duce. They wanted to be the boss, a presidente. You know what I mean? So that's when they said, well, let's just make this a democracy and put a father ahead of all their families and then like a board of directors. That's where Mylansky came in with the business approach. And that's how it's been run since the 40s. So yeah, you're 100% right. And that's democracy. Can never live in a communist country because it just doesn't work. Sounds good. I, I want to fire off. I know Danny's got another question, but I want to fire off some names. And then, you know, if you know them or what you know about them, maybe you could just a one liner about some of these these figures. Um, we've interviewed most of them. And I just want I want to know what you know about. Them. Right. So so let's you, you mentioned, you know, Sonny Francis at the beginning, your family right. knew him. What do you say about him? Sonny? Yeah. Epitome of a gangster. Epitome of a gangster. Probably. Yes. Well, yeah. Between him and John, I don't think anybody was more gangster than either one of those guys. John Sonny's Body? the top. Sonny, yeah. They, those guys were what they were and never ran from it. They lived how they were and they died how they were. They went to jail how they were. Not those. Yeah, those guys. Is, there's nobody more real in the life than a guy like Sonny Francis, especially his longevity. Probably Sonny's the, probably the epitome of a mafioso. Wow. Michael Francis, his son? Businessman, college kid, smart, did his time, never testified against nobody. And once that was over, he went into business. Like, you know, he was a business guy, smart. Nice. John Elite? Killer. First hand knowledge. Tough guy. Tough with his hands, tough with a gun. Type of guy that can uh, probably slit your throat and sit down and finish his own gaming. Wow. Okay. Street guy, straight up street guy. 
I don't know as a mafioso, but street guy. Sammy the Bull? Gangster. I don't care what anybody says about Sammy. I knew guys. Sammy was smart, cunning. If you weren't earning big money or killing people, he didn't have you around him. I knew three guys that were around Sammy. They were all killers. They all did time, 20 years, 10 years. Murder, mayhem. Uh, he walked through Brooklyn. He walked through Brooklyn like a god. Like people feared him. He was a boxer. I remember guys didn't guys didn't want to get in the ring with him. I know tough guys that were scared of him. So you know, I, you hear things. Listen, I'm one of the biggest John Gotti supporters in the world, senior. And I was sick when Sammy did. He's a rat. He's this. He's that. Then you look at it with a more clearer head. Yeah, he did all of those things, but he was a gangster. He was in the streets. He killed and responsible for 19 bodies that we know. You know, he didn't keep people around him that were slackers. He was smart. He kept people around him that earned and that would kill for him. To me, that's what a gangster does. Paul Castellano? Great businessman. Didn't have a head for the streets, but a great businessman. I think that um, his family still profiting off his legitimate businesses. He's lost, uh, I think, Western Beef. Is something that he invested in and he had something to do with letting Purdue chicken into grocery stores. He was just a businessman from my understanding. Very good one. And shifting from the, the mafia figures, you ever listen to a guy named Andrew Tate? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's good for entertainment. I don't believe he's anything like he talks. I feel bad what he's going through right now. But I listen to Andrew, everything that he's done. I didn't like him as a fighter. I, I, I think he's very entertaining. I don't think he's anything like he says. In terms of like which way? Misogynist, oh, you know, okay. that conceited. Not, he's probably a narcissist. I don't think he's a sociopath. I've listened to a lot of what Andrew Tate does. And you can hear it in his voice that some of it just might be good for the internet. Got it. Donald Trump? Great guy. I don't know him as a president. I'm not getting into all of this. I don't do politics. <laughs> I met Donald. I know people that's done businesses with Donald. Donald, um, we were born on the same day. We were born in the same hospital, me and him. Uh, he did a lot for Jamaica, Queens, which a lot of people don't know, which is a very African-American neighborhood because they call him racist. He's not a racist. I met Donald. I spoke with Donald. I know people that have done business with Donald. I've been all over New York when Donald was running through New York. Not a bad word to say about Donald Trump. I don't get involved in politics. So I don't want to hear about all this racist and everything else. He was great for the country. He was great, meaning business-wise, you know, unemployment, jobs. The num- I mean, you just open up the paper and read the numbers. The numbers spoke for themselves. But anything else to do with politics, I, I don't even look at or read. One last one, because I asked about Donald Trump. Joe Biden. I just don't think anybody that old should be in office. Anything can happen. Parkinson's all time. I mean, just look at the statistics after 65. They're incredible. And they increase every year after that. So I don't think anybody that old should be in the office. Great answer. Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anthony, we always like to ask our guests uh, this question. And um, we're just curious to see, you know, what your thoughts are. So if you could get a time machine and could go back in time and talk to your younger self, would you, what would you tell them? Would you, would you tell your younger self, you know, change your mind, don't go into the life. Uh, if you're talking to anybody right now, if anyone's listening to this that's younger, what, what kind of advice would you give for them? Uh, so two part question. Well, just being honest, I would, I had the chances to invest in certain stocks that could have took me well away from this country, this world, retired. That's all I would tell my younger self. I, there's really no other regrets. Yeah, of course. Do you want to take away that time that you spent in jail? I got over 10 years in jail altogether. You know? Yeah, of course you want that time back. But I met good people. I learned things that probably kept me alive. So I don't know. You know, it's very hard. When you seriously sit down and think about it, as, you know, an intelligent person would do, you don't know if that time saved your life or took away from your life growing up the way I did. Now, if I grew up a different way on Long Island or in California or something else, I would say that. But growing up the way I did, jail might have helped me live longer. I don't know. But I would, it's stocks, Yahoo, Bitcoin. I got offered those things very early on. I was investing in stocks like Cisco and Nextel. I was doing legitimate things for my money. 
And I got introduced to Bitcoin and I invested in the UK instead at $12. And it was a lot of money, about 10 grand. And I took it out of Cisco and put it into AOLA on the UK. And that's when it, it wound up crashing. It was like supposed to be like a new AOL. And it wound up crashing. But the person also offered me Bitcoin. But they didn't even, under, my broker didn't even understand it. So I did it. So I would go back to Yahoo I got introduced to when I invested in Nextel before Nextel got big. So Yahoo was one and Bitcoin was, I know people got a thousand Bitcoin stores. Mine was legitimate from a broker that did, had no idea about, they said Yahoo was going to be the next big thing, but I went into Nextel instead because I thought that was an awesome thing. And then I got, I had, I pulled out a Cisco, which I should have kept it in. And I had ALLA in the UK. I was trying to move my money out just because it didn't look good in the United States for making money. And then um, Bitcoin, but she didn't. It was a woman broker. And she didn't. So I think those were the only two things. It was Yahoo and Bitcoin were two big things in my life. But I probably would have never did Bitcoin because nobody knew about it at twelve dollars. Yeah, sounds good. And any advice but yeah, for I any just, of the young people? You know, people if anybody that... says I'll go back and tell my younger self never to go in the streets, never. What were you gonna do? Get bullied, get picked on, become a newscaster, become a, a, an iron worker? Come on, I, you, know, it's, it's, you ever listen to somebody's answers and think in reality? Where you grew up and how you grew up, that's what you were going to become? Come on. Stay in school. We all stood in school. We all got education. What does that mean? I don't believe oh, it. Right. I'm a realist. That's the be best I can real. be, guys. Yeah. <laughs> keeping it real, man. Real tough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, they're going to come after me. For, I don't commit crimes anymore. They can come after me for whatever they can. Fair enough. And you mentioned your book. Do you want to leave our audience with a last message where they could connect with you? Things like that? Well, hey, Hootie 282, Hootie Social Club on YouTube. I, I really don't do too much promoting. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, I'm just waiting. I got a deal. I got it written. I got, you know, it's just not the time yet. Everybody okay. writes a book. Everybody does this. Everybody. I don't want to be everybody. You know what I mean? I'm happy that I lived this long. I'm happy where I am in life right now. So, I mean, I'm not trying to, I'm not looking for the golden goose anymore. I'm good. Yeah, fair enough. All right. Awesome episode, you guys. Anthony, thank you for coming on. And guys, don't forget to like and subscribe and leave us a comment. Connect with us on IG, Matthew Ablican, Danny Ablican, and Anthony Russo. Thanks for coming on the show. Appreciate it, guys. Thank you. It was a, and it was a pleasure to meet both of you. Two gentlemen, very good communication, very professional, and I, I really do appreciate it. And uh, shout out to Carson, the editor. Does a great job on the hey. show as well. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, sorry, I, you know what? I didn't ask you. We could just keep keep this going, keep it rolling. How'd you get the nickname Hootie? It came from Hoot Nanny. I I used to I grew up around when I first started working in the wire room, nineteen ninety one. I grew up around some real tough guys, and they used to break my balls. I used to have my shirt off. I used to think I was like, you know, Rudy Valentino, tough guy. I was like forty pounds, and uh, they said, you know, say guys who talk about. You shut the lights and rape you in this room. Like I had some real tough guys who put my fist through you. I said, I don't give a fuck. They didn't know my name. I just started coming around this area. And uh, I said, I don't give a fuck. Who, nanny, what you do? So I was in the park one day. I'm hanging out with a pretty girl. And they were like, oh, look, there goes that hootie kid, cutie hootie. And it came from cutie hootie. So cutie hootie stuck with me till I was like 18. And they called me hootie for short for hoot nanny. They didn't know my name. I just started hanging out. In a lot of years, I remember I sent one of them a, 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 an invite. An older guy, mentor, like first guy to introduce me to Peter Lucas. And I sent him an invite for my engagement party. I was very young at the time. And he went around asking people, who the fuck's this Anthony Russo? <laughs> I, I, I know the guy 10 years now. And he didn't know my name was Anthony Russo. The guys <laughs> in the streets thought that was cool. Like, no, like if you know, people tell on you, his name is Hootie. No one ever called me Anthony you. when I moved to this uh, ADA park. No one ever called me Anthony. That was, I left that back in city line and that's a cutie hootie came from that. And then hootie, no, even people that started calling me hootie in the light didn't know it was hootie man. They just thought it was hootie. Gotcha. 1991. Awesome. 1991, the year I was born. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> oh, there you thanks. Go. I needed that. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> thanks for making me feel old. <laughs> no, you're good. You're good. Again, this was great. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for coming on the show. I actually did. I hope I'm invited back. I had a great time with you guys today. Always. In, in person next time. We got to do it in person. Absolutely. I, they won't give me back my passport yet. We'll come to you. All right. Absolutely. Great, guys. Thanks again. Thank you, Thanks, Anthony. Anthony. Have a good day. Take care.